All right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to Exodus, Exodus chapter 33, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse, and I uh, uh, do appreciate the singing so much. It encourages my heart that there will be another generation. Exodus chapter 33 in the first verse. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite and the Jebusite unto a land flowing with milk and honey for I will not go up in the midst of thee for thou art a stiff-necked people lest I consume thee in the way and when the people heard these, heard these evil tidings they mourned and no man did put on his ornaments for the Lord said unto Moses Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up un into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy, thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. Mm -hmm. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out into the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out into the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent's door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar des descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the taberna tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people that thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet, Thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast found grace in my sight. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this book. God, what a people that are privileged that we have an entire scripture in our own tongue, and we praise you for that. God, we thank you for everyone that is here today, every person that's among us uh, by your divine appointment and not by accident. God, save the lost according to your mercy and grace, we pray it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we'll be preaching on the eternal grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now many people will mis mistakenly believe that grace is a New Testament doctrine, but grace has been around since the beginning of man. Uh, when Adam and Eve... Uh, fell in the garden, grace arrived and, and give them a sacrifice that put, put them back in the will of God. That's grace. The grace was that they did not have to die themselves. They were not cast into hell, and so that is grace intervened. It has always been the means from the time of the fall in the garden to now, it's always been the means that God has de dealt with his people. Uh, the law really accomplished nothing except to this end. The Bible says God, I mean, the law is our schoolmaster, and it defines to us 
what sin is. That's the, really the only purpose, but grace has always been uh, the motivating factor of the law. Now, if you will go back with me to the beginning of our text, and I want you to see it begins with uh, the promise restated that he had made to his people for years. Now, he says, and the Lord said unto Moses, now, again and again and again through all the books of Moses, you will find that the Lord spoke to Moses individually. Now, this is just my own, uh, all my own thoughts, and you can take it for what it's worth. It's Larry. It's not thus saith the Lord. But I truly believe the only redeemed that came out of Egypt was Joshua, Caleb, and Moses. I think the rest were lost. They were bent toward hell. They were bent toward rebellion. And the best I can see, nothing changed about them in the whole 40 years that they were wandering around, which should have been a two-week journey. And I never saw any dynamic change in their lives. And so uh, I can't help but believe there was not many redeemed among them. So he restates that one more time. And the Lord said unto Moses, depart and go up hence, meaning toward the land of Canaan, toward the promised land. Uh, you know what? You can't stay in this world and serve God too. Uh, remember uh, Joshua, and I believe that's why he stayed behind in the tabernacle. Uh, uh, he, uh, he made this declaration when he took command. He said, choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24. Now, that, that, uh, that is a still a very real doctrine. Never convince yourself you can live in sin and have the blessings of God. It is not true. Now, modern-day evangelism may teach you that, but uh, they can teach you a lot of things, but it doesn't make them so. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, Thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, and to the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, unto thy seed, and unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out. Now, he begins to make a promise that the majority of the people never believed. That I'm going to drive out these people before you. Now, there's not one person under the sound of my voice that does not have some form of fear. Every one of us is afraid of something. Uh, and they became fearful of these uh, groups of people that God defined and says, I'm going to send an angel before them, I mean before you, I will get them out of your way. Now, how many of you genuinely believe this morning that the Lord God is going to get your problems out of your way, or do you believe they're there forever? See, the majority did not believe. The majority did not take that to heart. The majority uh, really believed that it could not be done. And, and so we find that these opposers of truth outnumbered them greatly. Now, this is not a news flash for you, but the opposers of truth outnumber us by great and far. Now, when I say that, I don't mean the religious. I mean the true followers and seekers of the Lord. Uh, news flash were outnumbered. Now, to most people, that's a scary thought. Uh, you know, uh, I, I didn't do it because I thought it would be in poor taste. Uh, there was a thing on Facebook uh, that said, name everything you learned from, uh, uh, what was the evangelist? I uh, can't remember his name. Uh, Frank? I can't believe it. Uh, anyway, uh, famous evangelist, three things that you learned from him. He was real big in the 70s. Uh, not Jimmy Swagger, it was... He used to be Southern Baptist. Anyway, uh, he died at 95. 
Uh, Billy Graham, thank you. I'm going to give my mother-in-law the button for the day. Uh, but uh, said, name five things you learned from Billy Graham. And I was very tempted to put nothing, 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 and nothing. Because you know what? He was a charlatan. He, he, he was not a truth seeker. And you think about it in the 70s. I don't remember the 70s that well. But think about the 70s and all, I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of people that followed him. And this is the thing that wasn't known. When they made their big move down front, <laughs> there was a Catholic, a Presbyterian, uh, Anglican Church, Baptist, Methodist, and they assigned an evangelist to you depending on how you grew up. What kind of evangelism is that? Nothing, nothing, and nothing. And, and, and so we find that in this day, they did not believe either. They were convinced that the enemy was larger than them. Verse 3, he says, I'm going to show you unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee. I will not go up with thee. Now, if you're in rebellion to God, and we'll see this in a very physical way in a moment, if you're not in the will of God, He is not going to lead you. He is not going to guide you. If you're not in the will of God, listen, church, you're on your own. That, that's why it's a very dangerous thing to discipline and then ultimately exclude someone from a church. You better have the mind of God because it's a fearful thing. Uh, the psalmist said it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. And, 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 and such it is. And so he says, I'm not going to lead you. I'm not going to guide you because you're a stiff-necked people. When I jerk to the right, you want to go left. And if I jerk to the left, you want to go right. You're stiff-necked. You're not a following people. Verse 4, and when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. Now, uh, that's good to a point, but did you know there's a, a, a huge difference between mourning and repentance? Uh, mourning is a type of sorrow. Repentance is a, sor uh, is a sorrow over sin but then you repent and you, you align yourself back with the Word of God. Uh, sorrow is not, it accomplishes nothing. Mourning over your present state is fine if it impacts change. And if it doesn't impact change, you know what the reality is? You're sorry you got caught. And, and so we find then that these people had a response to it. I want you to see also it says they took off their ornaments. Now, I personally believe that this was things that they had been wearing since the day of victory in uh, Exodus 14 when the river crossed for them uh, and, and slammed to on the Egyptians and Pharaoh and his armies were defeated. They still had on the celebratory garments but you can put on what you want to, can't you? Uh, no. Just because I put on a three-piece suit don't make me rich. And I think they were glad they were delivered. But you know what? When I nearly have a car wreck and I get out of it, I'm glad I was delivered, would not you? That don't make you repentive. That, that, that doesn't draw you unto Christ. And, and, and so we see... The Lord God in all his great wisdom and understanding, he knew that. Verse 5. And the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked 
hate calls. Now, you know what? I love to preach on glory. I, I love to preach on what's coming. I want to talk, I, I love to talk about the ease and the beauty of the third heaven that one day we'll be in. But sometimes, you know, you know what? <laughs> I bet Moses wished for a sermon that he could say, hey, we're going to be in the promised land. We're going to have oil. We're going to have honey. And we're going to have a place to feed our stock. Everything's going to be great. But God said, you tell them they are a stiff-necked people. Not amen, Brother Larry, kind of stuff. Amen, Moses. You got it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's very difficult sometimes for a man of God to be obedient to the Lord. And the reason behind that is because it is sometimes not good news. Sometimes it's not something you're thrilled about. The rest of verse 5, I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment, and I will consume thee, therefore, now put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. Now I want you to see that he said, uh, take off the ornaments and I want to remind you I, I can consume thee. Now we live in a day, to, an age today which everything is love. Now, first of all, I'd be willing to, to throw out there, it's very difficult for mankind to really love to start with. Now, I think the older you get, the more you understand love, and the more you can depart from what love and lust is, and there is a huge, huge difference. And uh, But I, I want you to see... <laughs> That love sometimes involves discipline. Mm -hmm. and love, and he told, you know, God goes a lot further than being love. He is love. He's the very essence of love. But let me ask you this about your children, because I know you love your children. Sometimes it has to come to, to discipline, doesn't it? If you really, really love them, you will show them what is wrong. And, and, and the Lord God got to the point, and he says, it's time for discipline. Take the ornaments off. You're wearing them unjustly anyway, and I am going to decide what the punishment is. What is going to be the end result? Verse 6, And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the mount of Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. Now, this is, this is very significant because up to this time, as they were going, uh, and, and they would get that back, but where typically was the tabernacle pitched? In the center of the camp. And they would have three tribes to the north, Three out the tribes to the west, three tribes to the south, and three tribes to the east. That was the organization of the camp, literally centered around the person of God. And, and so Moses said, I'm going to take it over there. You, and, and so we can conclude from that, when we're not in the will of God, he removes himself. Yeah. When we will not follow him, he simply removes himself leaves you cold and empty and dark and without leadership. See, that's the part of modern evangelism uh, that you don't hear about is the discipline of the Father. Him, uh, him correcting us in our wrong. Verse 7. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went into the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Now, this is significant because not everyone did it, 
And they literally had to move toward the presence of God. Now, God wasn't literally like in the temple, but the temple was a symbol of his presence. And he says, if you love me, move toward me. You know, many of the things that we do in the modern day uh, have no real value, but hopefully they will move us toward God. You know, you know what the attending of the Lord's church is about? I, I think it's twofold. Number one, we're commanded to do so. Number two, it's our time to worship who He is. You know, every one of us, all growing up around the lakes, well, I can serve the Lord just as well in a fishing boat as, as I can out in the church. No, you can't. That's a lie right out of the pits of hell. I guess it's just made for us to live between the rivers. That, that was one thing, deception for us. It honors God to come. And better than that, it nourishes you. Mm -hmm. But we see, and I want you to see that the scripture specifically says it was a far out front side of the camp. Now, every one of us, all, we all have a vehicle in the parking lot this morning. And we're blessed to be able to go in to the house of the Lord. Most people, most people don't even grasp that. When I was in South America, I would say 95% of all those three groups walked to the assembly. Not 5% not, not of them owned a vehicle. They're, they're very rare down there. And the ones you find certainly aren't what we draw, drive. And, and, and so I find people, and I hear history down in the land between the lakes. You know what determined where you went to church? Whichever was the closest. I, I, I'm sure that we can be, there'd be people that would remember that. See, that should not be the determining factor. Even if the church is far off, Listen, it's worth it to walk that far. It's worth it to seek the truth. And he says, if, you, if you're really interested, we're going to be outside the camp. We're going to be afar off. And you need to make, the, make that imposition that you're going through, that difficulty you're going through, is worth with the presence of the Lord. And so some did go and some didn't. And it came to pass, verse 8, when Moses went into the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. Now, in verse 8, I don't know if there's a change. I don't see that, that only Moses could go. And the reason I don't see that is because we find Joshua there too. One person, one individual still up there, and Moses. Now, you know, uh, as a preacher for many, many years now, it's discouraging when one individual shows up. Everybody else gone. But you know what I have found? <laughs> There's a sweet time of fellowship. Mo Moses was about to have a very intricate, a very wonderful experience with the Lord. Uh, I, I, I'm careful of using that word uh, because Pentecostals have run it into the ground. But you know, in addition to the day the Lord saved my soul, there's been multiple times that we've spent sweet, sweet fellowship, me learning for Him and just sitting and waiting for the Lord to speak to me. That, that, that's the reality of serving our Lord even today. Uh, still waiting on the Lord and, and at His bidding, not at our bidding, at His bidding, Him speaking to us. So we found just a couple of individuals that would do that. Verse 9. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. 
Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, and I don't know how long this went on. The Bible doesn't say. We, we somehow immediately assume it was just minute to minute to minute on the very same day. But have you ever considered that, the Mo that Moses and Joshua were the only ones still going? You ever thought about what you will be doing 20 years from now? Uh, in 20 years, I will be almost 75. Will I still be plugging away? Will I, will I still have an interest in the things of God? In that time, 20 years from now, will it be just me and Don left? Now, we've got a lot of young people. I certainly hope that's not true. But whatever this time span was, Moses and Joshua were the only one there. Have you ever thought that when the Lord shows up, you're going to be absent? You know, that does happen. Who was absent when the Lord showed up to the church? Thomas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? He missed it all. He, 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 didn't, he didn't see the wounds. He didn't see Christ. He didn't hear him see peace be unto you. He didn't see him come through the walls. He saw nothing. And you know why? Because he was absent. <laughs> I don't want to be like that, do you? I don't want to miss things like that. And so we find that uh, we, as the same way, keep showing up. Keep praying for your lost children. Keep praying for your lost grandchildren. Uh, stay in there. Be faithful. And you know what? By the word of God, he'll eventually show up. He'll eventually come on the scene. He will eventually manifest himself. As he did right here, as Moses went up to the temple. Verse 10. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all people rose up to worship every man in his tent door. Now, where would you like to worship this morning? Now, there is not, there is one of us in this building that actually lives in Dover. Uh, Eric lives about two blocks that way. Do you want to be that far from the Lord when he shows up? Uh, Brother Jody and his family, what is it, 25, 30 miles? That's a long way to be, ain't it? I don't, I don't want to be standing in my tent door, do you? I want to be at the tabernacle. I want to be at the house of the Lord. Me and Donna are at home. We're about 11 miles from here. I can't hear what's going on in Dover. Sometimes I'm very glad that I can't. But if the Lord showed up, I'd want to be here. You see what I'm saying? That closeness comes by effort. Now, we know our God is sovereign, and, and he draweth whom he will. <laughs> but, you know, when, uh, when Paul wrote the, the letter concerning the crowns, there's a crown of faithfulness. And people that lay it out of church, people with no real reason, do not come. Do not plug in. You know what? You can come and be gone. I've done it. <laughs> I, I know that to be true. But will you get anything out of it? I, I, don't, I don't think you're at the tabernacle like that. And, and so Moses comes down. He wants to hear from God. And he begins to hear the God from God while everybody else is having it down at their house. Verse 11, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. Now this happened numerous times. I used to think it was only the time that he got the law, but that's not true. Uh, the very first time, uh, back on the back side of the desert, remember he didn't get too close to the Lord that time. He was meeting the Lord. You know, he had heard about the Lord all his life. He chose to be a Jew when he could have been the emperor of Egypt. And he chose to be with God's people. Good choice, Moses. 
but he didn't even know the Lord he was talking about. I met a lot of people like that in 25 years, just as empty and dry as a saltine cracker. And then, he's on the back side of the desert, best I can calculate at the, at the easiest, 40 years later. Finally, he meets the Lord. And you see what an impact it was uh, on his life. A salvation with no impact, you watch them. You know what? Every year, that little tree out there, and I'm going to try to help it some this year, puts his peaches out, and the squirrels get them. And uh, I anticipate that every year, don't you? It's happened every year since we've been here. Why would we not look for it again? Why don't we anticipate fruit from believers? Right? Uh, that's what the Bible said. You should know them by their fruits. Should we not anticipate that? And, and, and so we see that because Moses had uh, a genuine salvation experience, he got to experience fellowship that others did not. And the Lord spake unto Moses, verse 11, face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. You know what, what a wonderful, wonderful blessing that is. Ever think about how many friends you really have? You know, I would say I'm looking at my group of best friends. But, you know, uh, I have a few that are not in the church. I've, I've had one church, um, one friend, we've been friends for 49 years. We started kindergarten together. We were five years old. And we still talk today. She come over and help Donna uh, with Quilt uh, several months ago. And, you know, as soon as she texts, without, without even reading who it's from, I know who it is. You know why? Because even in texting, I know her voice. <laughs> I know her phrases. I know, I know who it is. And, and that's how dear friends are, right? All your life, you know who they are. And same way... If you have a dear friend in the person of Christ and he comes calling, you know who he is. You, you, you know that he's there to speak to you as a friend doeth to a friend. And, and, and to give you fellowship and to give you instruction and to give you hope. Then notice what the rest of the verse says. And he, meaning Moses, turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man... Departed out, of, de departed not out of the tabernacle. Now we find Joshua gets just a little taste of it that will last him the rest of his life. See, if you're ever around when the Lord begins to move, that that'll be enough. You, it, you know, it won't suffice you, but it'll make you want it again and again and again. Now, if you don't make, know what I'm speaking of, at least in the salvation experience you're trusting, if you don't know you fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ as a man fellowships with man, Dear friend, make your calling and election sure because you may not have what you think you have. And, and so we find then that uh, I want to be like Joshua. You know, if, if the Lord shows up, I'll stay in the temple all afternoon. Brother Jarrett was teasing me, or I hope he was teasing me, that I'd have to cut it short today uh, to get us back on, on schedule. You know, if the Lord shows up, I'd be glad to take it all evening, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. What makes a difference if the Lord... Now, I've been in services where people, where men preach just because they like to hear themselves speak, <laughs> right? The Lord ain't within a thousand miles of that. And boy, when you're sitting there with your backside sore, you know it, right? But when the Lord shows up, oh, what a difference. Amen. Oh, what a blessing. It'll make you be able to sit there and enjoy it. So we see that Joshua got just a little bit of that. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring this people up, and thou hast not let me know 
whom thou wilt send with me, yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. Now, I think this is very significant because Moses said, you told me to bring these people up, but you didn't even tell me who would go. <laughs> you know what? That, that's the ministry. <laughs> Lord called me to preach. I began a preaching ministry in, in October. It will be 29 years. He never said, Larry, I'm going to save 65 people and I need you to do this. You know what he told me? Preach the gospel. And, and the harvest is up to the Almighty. You know what? It wasn't none of Moses' business who he was going to get. And it wasn't none of Moses' business who will be led over. And, and you know the rest of the story, uh, the majority of them had to die before they even got to the promised land. Then he says, Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now, isn't it a wonderful thing that even many, 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 many years, thousand years before the ministry of Christ, grace was the means. He said, you found grace, and I know thee by name. What a rich, wonderful blessing. You know, uh, I've never known very many people that like their name. Middle names seem to be especially the ones they don't like. Larry Wayne. I'm like, Mama, where'd you come up with that? Come on. And, and, and to make matters worse, my dad was named James, my mother was named Ju June, and then they named my brother James and Judy after mother, Judy June. And they come up with Larry. I'm like, who do I belong to? The milkman? <laughs> Was his name Larry? And, but you know what? The rich and wonderful truth, he knows Larry Larry. And he's called me by name. That makes it a little bit more satisfying, do not it? it? It makes you a, a little bit understanding why sometimes <laughs> names can be so different, and, 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 and yet you rejoice in them. I know thee by name. Verse 13. Now therefore, I pray thee, this is Moses speaking to the Almighty, if I have found grace in thy sight, shew me now thy way, that I may know thee. Mm -hmm. Thy way. Now, Moses was fixing to have another rough road for 40 years till he would be the age of 120. Uh, you know what? He wanted to know God's way. God's way was not pleasant. And newsflash, God's way is still not pleasant. That's why he said, ye are pilgrims and strangers. That's why all these evangelists today, oh, it'll be wonderful when you let the Lord save you. <laughs> After my redemption, I, think, I believe things got more bumpy, don't you? A little bit rougher, a little bit more difficult. And, and the closer I draw unto the person of Christ, the rougher it gets. Now that's the reality of Christian service. You'll lose a lot of people who, who, you, who you love, won't you, Jared? You see, that sadly, that is serving the Lord. That, that is true commitment. And, and Moses said, all I want to know is I'll do, <laughs> I want to know thy will. His will was through the roughest part of the desert. His will was they're going to starve to death if <laughs> bread don't fall from the sky. His will was that the water source would be out of a rock. <laughs> See, the will of God is not always pleasant, is it? is it? But it's a sweet place to live. That's where grace will suffice. Uh, do you know the Lord? Really, that's the only question in this life that really matters. Uh, everybody, Caleb Moore used to attend this church, Tim and Jeff's boy. He was really small, I think the same age as Matthew, maybe a little younger than Matthew. He's grown now, married. And he put something on Facebook, and Caleb is a good kid. 
And he says, this evens us up. And it was a mansion and a grave on that side of the property line. And it was a shack and a grave on that side of the property line. And it's done. So the real, the real thing is, do you know the Lord? The one question that needs to be answered before you leave this place. 